All right, I think we're live here. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our very first episode of the Grapevine Live Show, which is an extension of the Muscle Mix monthly newsletter called the Grapevine. So welcome. I'm so excited for our first episode today. We have Christine Conti and Carly Taylor with us. We're going to be talking about eating disorders in the fitness industry. So it's a super important topic that I don't think gets talked about enough. And so I'm so happy that all of you are here. For anyone that's watching, whether you're here live or watching the recording, drop your name in the comment. Let us know where you're listening from and get involved in the conversation because it's so much better when when we're all together and collaborating and talking through all of these details. As we get started, in case I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, I'm Melissa Merkel. I'm the Director of Partnerships here at Muscle Mix. And again, welcome. All right, so Christine and Carly, thank you so, so much for being here. I'd love for you both to introduce yourselves, what brought you here, how you guys got connected on all of this, and and we'll go from there. So Christine, do you want to start? Sure. My name is Christine Conti, and as a former investment banker, teacher, coach, been in the fitness industry for over 20 years now, and um, love everything about movement and fitness and you name it, um, I have been an eating disorder survivor for probably most of my life. And when Carly and I speak and talk about eating disorders, you know, we can tell you all about all of our accolades and qualify ourselves with fitness and, you know, business and degrees. But really, I think the most important thing right now is that we are just like many of you and we take things one day at a time. And just so happens that maybe the difference between all of us is that Carly and I refuse not to speak. And we've realized in the fitness industry, especially, and it could be athletes, that it's not saying something is not okay. And for the two of us and our stories, there are so many situations and instances in our life where we wish people would have said something or not said something. <laughs> and sometimes when people speak, they don't even realize the impact of what they say. And when the two of us met, which I'll let Carly get into that in a second, we kind of realized and connected. We had similar stories. We were both presenting at a fitness conference and looked around and realized no one's talking about this. And the two of us realizing what, you know, we're both survivors. And uh, I'm not saying that, you know, anyone had totally overcomes and, you know, beats any disordered eating or eating disorders, but it's something that we're aware of and we work on and we help other people get to the same point of being able to talk and, and what are your coping skills? And I'm gonna pass it along to Carly because this, when we met was kind of the epiphany of, we've gotta do something and we have the ability to make some change and to shed some light on something that just is not spoken about and is so prevalent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I can relate to not speaking about it because I didn't talk about it for probably the first 10 years of my fitness career. I was afraid that if someone thought that I had an eating disorder, then they wouldn't take me seriously as a fitness professional. Mm -hmm. And Christine and I started talking about exactly that because we realized that there are probably so many people that are suffering from that right now fitness professionals who don't talk about it, who hide their own issues, who hide behind Instagram profiles and things like that and bury the real stuff because they don't think people will pay the money to be their coach, their trainer, their inspiration if they're quote, not normal. 
So my background, like Christine's, isn't in fitness from the beginning. I have a background in criminal psychology, actually, and then came into fitness um, in the late 90s. Oh, God. Yeah. Late 90s. Um, started with spinning and step aerobics and yeah, personal training, and then worked in the corporate world in fitness, uh, vice president of personal training and sales for a gym chain. So I've seen this disease from many different angles. So whether it be in the corporate office, on the gym floor with trainers, coaches, or with clients, and I think it's everywhere. I think everyone is afraid to talk about it. Well, everyone was. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen it too. So many different places, whether it's with trainers or with clients or, or fitness competitors. Um, and, and you're right. I think, especially as fitness professionals, like we're supposed to have this all figured out and, (laughs) you know, and like, we're supposed to look a certain part. And, and I think that is not only the pressure that adds to it, but also Mm -hmm. like the shame around like struggling with it. When in reality, I think there are a lot of us in the industry that, that do. So I thank you both for the work that you're doing and opening up this conversation because you're right up until now, like I haven't really seen it discussed a whole lot. And so, so thank you both. And, and I think we'll jump right in. Um, I know we're going to hit on on some different topics. Um, Before we do though, I wanted to mention the course that you guys have out now because you've collaborated and created a course on MedFit Network about eating disorders. So can you tell us a little bit about that as we, you know, kind of go through the the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Carly and I always, we always um, talked about what can we do? And we knew that we were going to do something together. It was just when. And the time finally came where there was an opportunity to collaborate that would actually, you know, kind of light a fire with the two of us to actually get this work done. And we put together a course called Eating Disorders, What Fitness Professionals Need to Know. And that does sit on the MedFit Network platform. Um, However, you know, we do provide, you know, speaking, um, you know, courses, workshops, sessions for conferences, for schools, for companies, um, in addition to that. But for fitness professionals specifically, um, this is a course that, I mean, we'll talk about a little bit more today, but this is a course that should be mandatory. When you think about, okay, your CPR, you need that. Okay, we need to, you know, renew our CECs through different companies. Why is this, this huge issue, not something that is, you know, on that checklist and Carly and not Carly and I are not medical doctors. And we're very clear about that. This is not about sitting through a lecture of what is this? And what is that? We talk about it. We're going to, we're going to educate you on all different types of eating disorders and disordered eating, which is something else that we need to mention, but that in and of itself needs, you need to be aware of it, but how do you use it in your daily life? Because Carly and I would look around and see, you know, you'd see a registered nutritionist or, or dietitian or, or a psychologist, maybe talking about what everything is, but there Mm -hmm. was no implementation. Okay. I get it. I know what anorexia is, but now what? Like, yeah do I say something like, is this, how does this work? What do I do? It, and, you know, Carly, I'll let you finish on, you know, the course and the education. Yeah. I think, you know, we mentioned what all of these disorders are, but the really important part is what do you do when you have a person in front of you who you're thinking, Oh, I wonder if they have a problem or you have a person that comes to you and says, I'm recovering from anorexia or I am suffering with bulimia what do you do? And pretending that it can go away. Or, you know, if you're a trainer and someone says, oh, I broke my toe, you're like, okay, we're going to do upper body today. You can't do that with an eating disorder or disordered eating, right? You can't just avoid that part and focus on something else. It really has to be 
all encompassing. You need to be aware of the things that you say and how something really simple might have a really profound effect. Like having a client who is anorexic, for instance, and you're helping them gain muscle and they come into your office and you say, oh my God, that's awesome. You gained two pounds. Nice work. Ooh. So from your perspective as a trainer, you're excited. They're reaching their goals. Their goal on paper, you're looking at it. Their goal is to gain 10 pounds in the next three months. This is awesome. We're on our way. Mm-hmm. But what's going on in the mind and realistically in the body of that person who has for how long been trying to avoid gaining weight and now all of a sudden is being confronted with the fact that they have to and that they have. Mm-hmm. So in that situation, what recommendations would you have um, for, you know, kind of what, what to say to that person? In that kind of a situation, if someone is in recovery, it is not our job as trainers, coaches to put them on the scale. Their medical doctor will put them on the scale. It is our job to facilitate movement, to give them a workout program, to supervise that workout program and to motivate them to move. So it would never be our job to measure them or put them on a scale. But how many trainers do you know don't weigh their clients? Yeah. Well, and I think at a lot of gyms and facilities, like the protocol for trainers is to get those measurements and to do, you know, do all of the, the numbers, you know, have something to measure. So, so you would recommend not doing any of those things for someone that is struggling or, or going through recovery. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, I would go as far as to say, and I think Christine would too, unless someone comes to you specifically saying that their goal is to lose 10 pounds, you don't put them on the scale at all. There is no need for us as trainers or coaches to weigh or measure a client ever, unless they have a specific goal that comes with numbers. And that specific goal needs to be fleshed out quite a bit before you actually measure them and put them on the scale. There's a big why behind that that needs to be learned. And what are we doing with numbers anyway? That I mean, there, there's the next question. What does, you know, as a at becoming a runner later in my life, guess what? If you are at a lower body weight, many times you can run quicker because you're carrying around less. But that has nothing to do with, you know, your muscle may weigh more than fat. So someone that, you know, weighs more, they may actually be more powerful and have more endurance and strength than someone who is thinner. So like the number gain, it's interesting as I've gotten older and been around this industry for quite a while, growing up a competitive athlete, they would put us on the scale all the time. And, you know, it was, you've gained weight, you've lost weight, you need more strength, they'd measure you all the time. And for me, it was, that was normal. That was just what they did. And, you know, in hindsight, I see what that has done to so many people. And when we walk into gyms, and and I'm going to say it, this is one of the first, I already said, you know, off the air before we started, everyone, I told Melissa that I get riled up with some of this stuff. And Yes, you're right. Carly and I are telling you that you should not, gyms, boutiques, trainers, you should not be sticking your clients on the scale. Even if your client wants to lose weight, you don't need to stick them on the scale. If they want to go on the scale, they can go on the scale themselves. They can, they can do that. And we can't really control it. We can tell them like, listen, we don't really recommend it. Just how do you feel? How are your clothes fitting? Or Um, but also the body weight, we get so wrapped up in results and we get so wrapped up in, if I don't get my steps or if I don't clock my workout, it doesn't count. Where, where did this come from? It's this obsession and all of this, you know, is related to, you know, this whole psychology of behavior of disordered eating, it feeds into everything. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's something I think as a, as a personal trainer, if you're listening to this right now, ask yourself, what are you doing that may be extremely uncomfortable to the people you're working with, but you've never even batted an eyelash because you've done it your whole life. Mm-hmm. And that right there is why a lot of people don't talk about this, right? Because we've all done it. We've all in this industry, I've done it, Christine, that Christine's done it, Melissa, I'm sure you've done it. We've all said things, done things with clients that now looking back, you're like, oh, I got to find this person and give them their money back, <laughs> right? But you have to be able to turn that lens and look at yourself and be like, okay, I've messed up. I've learned from it. I'm owning it. And I'm here to say like, nobody's perfect, but we can't just pretend we didn't do it. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know so many people too in the industry and I can confidently say for all of us, like we have the best intentions. Like we're, we're in this business because we want to help people. And so anything that we have done has not clearly been done with bad intentions. Um, having said that, I kind of want to continue on this path. I want to ask your opinion on weight loss programs, because I know so many trainers and professionals offer weight loss program, myself included. So, I mean, I want to use this, you know, as a learning opportunity as well. Um, and a number of coaches out there say, and I believe that it's true weight loss sells. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you use those words, weight loss, you know, you're going to get more clients and all of these things, but I'd love your opinion on not only using that as like, I guess your marketing strategy, but weight loss programs in general. Um, how do you guys feel about that? Or how would you know if someone is right for a weight loss program? Because Carly, as you and I were talking before we came on, there are mm-hmm. genuinely people that do need to lose weight. So, yep. so how can you yep. do that safely? I guess is a question. I'm so glad that you asked this because I think a a common misconception about what Christine and I are doing. People think we're saying, no, your client, you you don't want your clients to lose weight. Don't make, don't help your clients lose weight. That's not what we're saying. There Mm -hmm. are a number of reasons for people to lose weight. However, it is not our job to assume automatically that our clients need or want to lose weight. There's the difference. Someone may have gone to a medical doctor who said to them, your heart is under stress. Your organs are under stress. In order to be healthy, you need to lose between 20 and 30 pounds. That person needs to lose weight. Mm -hmm. It's their decision. It's a kind of a two-part question because yes, weight loss sells. Putting that out there, that sells. And yeah, I don't think it's inappropriate to offer weight loss programs. I do think it's inappropriate to market to gen pop weight loss programs, glamorize it, filter Mm -hmm. things, encourage people to lose weight in X amount of time, um, Mm -hmm. post weights, post measurements, post before and after pictures, all of that stuff is a really slippery slope. Offering weight loss programs, I don't think it's a problem, but making that I guess glamorizing the after and not focusing on the during is where we get lost. I Mm. think too, that there's not a lot we can do about, we've talked about this forever and society, you have seen, you know, plus size models and you, you know, you have seen, you know, um, inclusion and diversity and, you know, there's all of these, all the things, right. To try and include everybody of all body shapes and sizes. And that's, you know, we may not be able to change people's mentality about what they should look like, but we sure as heck can educate them about movement. What is our goal in the fitness industry? What, let's strip this down to the bare minimum. We analyze movement. We analyze safe and effective movement. My job is to to help people live more quality lives, whatever that means. If you're an athlete that comes to me, what is, what's quality to you? You want to perform better. If you're someone who, you know, I work a lot with chronic diseases. 
if you're someone who just wants to not be in as much pain every day, living a normal life, that, you know, that's my job to give them exercises to help them with movement, with strength, kinetic chain. My job is not to say, hey, you know what? I think you'd be happier if you were, you know, less weight. Um, it, I mean, if they came to me and were like, you know, I'm on high blood pressure medicine, I've got, you know, high anxiety, my heart is this, and, and you know, my doctor said it would help to exercise. Yes, period, the end. You don't even talk about medications. You don't talk about any of it. All you say to them is, let's design you an exercise program that, and guess what? The exercise program then has all of those other ancillary results, like the, my blood pressure went down, my weight went down, oh, mm -hmm. my cardiovascular health improved. Like that's the stuff that we have, you know, the tools, but it's not our job to assess everything else. And I, I kind of think about that when we talk about weight at this point of weight loss and you know, we've all been a part of those, you know, Hey, who can lose the most amount of weight? I'm like, Oh my mm -hmm. gosh, it's, it's just not, you know, and they change the words too because they don't call it weight loss. They, you know, they'll just say, you know, Oh, what are some of the ones they call it now? It's like, you know, the, the help like body, body mass loss or something, you know, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, size, like, I don't care what you call it. I don't care what, you know, what you say. It's the same idea of, you know, kind of there's a finite line at the end of it. Well, what happens after that? We're trying to make lifetime improvements here, not just a jump start and then end. Jump start end. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I worked in the corporate world hosting a biggest loser competition for mm -hmm. like the employees. And mm -hmm. I don't remember the the parameters at this point, but there was, you know, there was very much that start and stop point and whoever loses the most, you know, like wins the pot of money and like all of those things. And, and I mean, going back to what we said earlier, like we're all guilty of doing things, you know, that with good intentions, but looking back on it, it's like, you know, maybe that wasn't the best choice. Um, but moving forward, I know you mentioned like the naming and some programs. So can we talk a little bit about naming classes and programs and challenges and, and all sorts of stuff like that? I've actually been on some calls with other, other trainers recently, and we've been brainstorming ideas for names for, you know, different challenges or programs. And, and it's really hard because we all want to be like creative and, you know, catchy, but at the same time, like there's so much around this topic that I, I don't think there's enough awareness about. So, so help us understand like some things that we should be aware of. Carly, I mean, can I, can we play? Can we play this game? This is my favorite game. I love we can play. to come up with names for Carly. And, and I love to see Carly deconstruct the why behind what is happening because Carly, I mean, one of my favorite classes forever was during Thanksgiving when we did our turkey burns. Right. Yeah. So a turkey burn tells us that we need to negate the calories that we ate. Turkey burn takes away all of the joy from a festive occasion, a holiday gathering, a family function. It tells us that what we did was wrong and we need to get rid of it. Turkey trot, I am cool with a turkey trot, right? Uh, it, um, I don't know, turkey, what else could it be? Turkey trot or a, a thank, turkey wobble. yeah, turkey wobble. All right, that, that's fine. Or a Thanksgiving something, you know, Thanksgiving spin class. We don't have to be quite so kitschy, but the idea is not to negate something that you've eaten kind of like, um, oh, I need to work out extra because I'm going to overeat or I need to earn my mimosa at brunch. You don't need to earn something that's going to A, nourish your body or B, something that you enjoy. You just don't. And that's part of our mentality that, well, I have to, I have to work it off or I have to 
get some kind of pre-burn before I quote indulge. Mm -hmm. We don't Sometimes have to punish ourselves for eating something that we enjoy. Yeah. I was just going to say, it's almost like you're punishing yourself for you, what, you know, whatever you're going to do later or whatever you've already done. And a absolutely. It, yeah. And then exercise becomes something that you completely view as a punishment. And there's that, like the whole connection with, with eating and exercise and how they fit together, as opposed to, to moving because it, it feels good. And exercising because you love your body, not because you hate it. Yeah. 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 And finding enjoyment in it. So, all right. I have two more, two okay. more. Ready? Awesome. Oh boy. Yeah. Carly. I mean, these are, these are two of my favorites. You see them all the time. I am positive. Everyone has seen these. One of them is about getting bikini body ready. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything bikini beach body, you got to get ready, you know, get the summer yep. body, beach body, bikini body. And then the other one, another favorite is the muffin blast. Oh yeah. That was my favorite too. So let's talk about beach body, bikini body, summer body. If you have a body and you put on a bikini, you have a bikini body. If you have a body and you take it to the beach, you have a beach body. You get where I'm going with this? So what we're saying to people when we advertise, get bikini ready in six weeks, we're saying to them, your body should not be in a bikini. That's what, they're, that's what they read when they see that. That's what mm -hmm. they feel. That's what they ingest. I need to change my body in order to go to the beach. Mm -hmm. Or at least to have fun at the beach. Yeah. Otherwise I'm going to be sitting underneath an umbrella with a blanket over me and a big hat and sunglasses. So nobody knows who I am because nobody wants to see this body in a bikini. And it's shame. There's a lot of shame that's associated with all of this that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, you're embarrassed because maybe you have, you know, eating disorder ideas or whatnot you're and then you're ashamed because of what you look like you could be 90 pounds you could be 590 pounds and you still have some sort of shame that you're carrying around and yeah and it's often the 90 pound person that thinks that they're 590 pounds at least that's what they see in the mirror so and then the, there's the muffin blast I, I can't not talk about that one that you mentioned anything that uses um a derogatory name or a term for a part of the body, right? You know what a muffin blast is? You're looking at the muffin top. So the part of your middle that comes up over your waistband, newsflash, everybody has it. If your pants just came out of the dryer and you put them on, you're going to have a muffin top. It's just the way that it is. You can have a 12 pack abs and sit down and look down, right? Like sit down and look down. You have a muffin top. Everybody does, but why do we need to call it that? Because what that does instantly is put that image in people's minds that it's something that needs to be blasted off. So anytime that you say you're going to remove something or take it away, erase something, um, you know, there, there are so many, you know, butts and guts classes and things like that. Like, talk about the movement. So you said you were brainstorming with trainers about what to call programs and classes. Focus on the movement. Focus on the movement. What's the movement? What's the, what's the goal with the movement? And focus on lighthearted, positive feelings that you could combine with movement. You know, feel better, move better. Things as simple as that. Mm -hmm. That's really good advice. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what about words or comments or phrases that maybe we should avoid. I know, for example, one of them, um, and I've heard both of you speak before, um, is you look great and different comments like that. What are some things that, that we should be aware of in the language that we use? I'll, I'll start and then hand it over to, to Carly. I think that, you know, if, if people are listening, you're live or you hear this, think right now in your, maybe in the last week, month, year, how many times have you said you look great to someone or something along those lines? And you may actually, if, if you keep this in, your, in front of your mind, you may catch yourself. And I know that I catch myself all the time. 
And this is a saying that we want to be very clear that if there's a bride, she's dolled up for her wedding and her hair and her dress and her, and you say to her, wow, you look great. That's fine. That's totally fine. There's a, you know, you have a friend you haven't seen in a while and she's, she's having a baby and she looks glowing and, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy for you. You look great. Fine. But when, especially in the context of fitness, especially in the context of fitness, and it could be out, but we're specifically focusing on you know, fitness professionals in the world of movement, when someone either you haven't seen, or maybe it's just they walk in and you haven't seen them in a week. Think about the implication. And, you know, Carly and I talk all the time about intent. When you say to someone, you look great, your intent is probably, you know, very it's simple. It, you know, and you don't mean any harm yet. The impact of that, especially someone that has struggled with disordered eating or eating disorders, Carly and I can talk on and on for hours about how many times people have said, you look great, or you look, you know, fill in the blank. And we take it in a way and internalize it to a, the point where all of a sudden we're too thin, we're overweight, we're th- and there's other things we could say that as a fitness professional that could have a much more positive impact, which I'm going to hand it over to Carly. Yeah, you look great sounds like it's no big deal, right? You just, you look great. You say that to people all the time. So I'll speak for me um, as someone who's been on the other side of the hump of an eating disorder, still there, but on the other side of the hump for probably about 15 years. If you said to me, if I walked into a gym and you were my trainer and you said you looked great, the chances are while I was walking into that gym, I was focused not on the way my body looks because I know that that is dangerous for me. So as I was walking into the gym, I was focused, eyes ahead, not looking at and any mirrors, thinking about the exercise that I was going to do and how I was going to feel as a result. And when you say to me, Haley, you look great. Now I'm just thinking about what I look like. And that's all I'm going to think about for the rest of that workout. Now that might seem extreme to some people. And that this is me talking as someone who's survived anorexia, exercise, bulimia, and binge eating disorder. So maybe it is severe, but think about this. Maybe someone has gone through a trauma. Maybe someone lost someone dear to them and they've just had trouble eating for the past two weeks because they just, they're sad. And you walk into the gym and someone says, you look great. They think, oh, I must have needed to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And for your average person, whatever that is, that might not have an impact. But for someone who is somewhere on the disordered eating spectrum, and I'll get back to that, That could have a huge impact. That comment that had good intent could have the impact of encouraging unhealthy behaviors for the next two, three, four days, weeks, months, years. Mm. So your better solution is when you see someone that you haven't seen for a while is it's great to see you instead of you look great. As a trainer, a coach, a group X instructor, when you see someone and you want to give them a compliment, look at you three days in a row, you are being so consistent. That's awesome. You must feel great. Or I saw you out on the gym floor and your squat form, lunge form, push up form, whatever has improved so drastically. You're doing such a great job. Hey, I saw you running on the track. I think you're getting faster. All of those things are compliments about someone's performance, not someone's physical shell. And I think that's where, as fitness professionals, we need to start to focus. Like Christine said earlier, our job is to coach movement, 
to analyze movement, to encourage movement. And that's what we need to really try to do. Stay in the lane of a movement coach, not a dietitian, not a weight loss coach, a movement coach. Because guess what? When you move more, if your body needs to lose weight, it will. Yeah. Melissa, you know what I was going to say too, is that when, um, and I'm sure, you know, your mind is probably going with this, but when you say you look great, like some of these comments, it's you putting judgment on somebody else like about, you know, like Carly said, focusing on physical looks versus, Mm -hmm. you know, it's great to see you is that's no judgment. There's no passing of judgment on that, or it seems like you're getting faster. These are like, you know, kind of statements as opposed to passing judgment. I thought that was kind of a, just a point to make when we start talking. Yeah, absolutely. I think that brings up a good point too. I recently saw a family friend who I hadn't seen in a few years because of the pandemic, they live in a different state. And I know one of the family members is dealing with an eating disorder right now. And, uh, and he had actually lost a lot of weight since I had seen him last. And, and I had to catch myself from saying, you look great because I, I know a little bit about what's going on and I didn't want to reinforce that. So it was, you know, thinking of the wording, like it, it is great to see you like, oh my goodness, you know, like, tell me about what's going on. But a lot of times we don't know if someone's struggling with things. And so I think it's really important to be mindful of the words that are coming out in all situations, because you don't know if that person is potentially, you know, dealing with the same thing as someone else. So I think it's super, super important, again, to bring that awareness and just be mindful of of what you say, because things that you say, like you look great, that are meant to be like loving and positive towards someone, you don't know how it's going to be taken. So words matter. And that's why, you know, that's one of our, you know, our speaking engagements and and whatnot. And and that is like you said, Melissa, far reaching. And, Mm -hmm. you know, again, we're starting with let's, let's talk about, let's open the dialogue in the fitness industry because it's so rampant and, and tell people, listen, words matter you know, what you say could be a trigger and be harmful when you think it's helping. And again, we're starting here, but like you said, a family friend, is it a coworker? And my, I even think about this all the time is that I wish, you know, my teachers or my family, you know, my mother or father knew any of this because they didn't. And they didn't really know what to say aside from, oh, I think something's wrong with her. Let's send her to a, you know, eventually, you know, eventually it was, you know, send her somewhere. And then you feel betrayed and you're shameful as opposed to making it a little bit of a conversation, at least knowing and having some empathy or or sympathy to be aware. And that's, again, whether you're a parent or you're a fitness instructor or a personal trainer, these are the conversations that may save lives. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think I wanted to add, just because you mentioned you hadn't seen them because of the pandemic. And I think that's a really important thing that we bring up because we are on the other side I hope, of a worldwide trauma. And fitness professionals, and I've seen it a lot recently, are taking advantage of that and saying things like the COVID-19, like the freshman 15, right? Because yeah, a lot of people either gained or lost weight during this period because we were stuck in our homes. We, there's a lot of situations, a lot of circumstances that people dealt with over the past two years that we have no clue about. And a lot of people turn to food in one way or another for comfort, whether it's restricting food or overindulging in food. And If there were the perfect time for people to start talking about this, this words matter and disordered eating behaviors, it is now because so many people who had not struggled with it are struggling right now because of the pandemic, 
because of this worldwide trauma that we've all been through. So Christine just said sympathy or empathy. We should all be able to find somewhere in us a little bit of empathy because we've all been through this. So I think this is, this is really the time to focus on it and to say, okay, I'm going to be better. We need to do better. Absolutely. You guys have both mentioned, you've used the terms eating disorders and disordered eating. Is there a difference? Is it oh. like where you are? Can you speak to that real quick? Yeah, this is my favorite. This one, this was mm-hmm. my favorite speech to give. So okay. eating disorders are your clinical classified disorders, anorexia, bulimia, exercise bulimia, orthorexia, uh, binge eating disorder. All of those are on one end of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum is intuitive eating, which means you eat what you want, when you want it, you eat until you're full, and then you walk away with no emotions involved. Oh, I, I hear there are people that do that. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, I don't know full? that world. <laughs> and, and then you have to know what full and hungry feels like. Yeah, like yeah a whole nother bag of worms. There. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, those people are unicorns and they're over here. And then the eating disordered are over here. And I'm gonna say 75% of people are on the spectrum and mm-hmm. they can move on the spectrum. You know, we've got good days and bad days. Some days we don't even think about it. And other days, everything that we put in our mouth has some kind of an emotional response. And that's the difference between an eating disorder and disordered eating. So things like, oh, I shouldn't eat this. Oh, I need to work out for an hour today because I had an extra scoop of ice cream last night. Oh, I need to wear a bathing suit next week. So I need to work out every day. Oh, I didn't close all my circles. I'm going to walk around the island in the kitchen 52,000 times before bed. Air right? work too. Yeah. Yeah. But all of that stuff, like, oh, I, you know, I, I'm in this contest and I have to run X amount of miles this week and it's nine o'clock on Sunday night and I haven't gotten it in. So I'm going to put on my headlamp and go run around the block. Like, that's not normal. <laughs> And we've all done it. And Carly, that's, you know, we were talking with Melissa before, you know, there's so many people that don't realize it. And I'm sure many of us have been guilty that, okay, for everyone that, you know, you are, you sign up for 5Ks or races or, you know, bike rides or swims or um, bodybuilding competitions and things like that. And you constantly are just in this cycle of restricting food and eating more food and, my body has to look a certain way or be in this weight or this is all, I mean, go to the, go to a gym and look at people that are bodybuilding. Just look, I mean, it's really powerful when you sit back and say, all right, what are they really eating and what's their goal? And is it about being healthy or is it about some psychological, I look better, I could attract different people. Like, I mean, we are hedonistic people. So there's so much more related to this. And again, is it normal to eat 10 pounds of protein, 10 pounds of chicken breasts every day? I mean, these are the, you know, is it normal to have eight protein supplement shakes every day? Or is it normal to just have one shake as a meal replacement three times a day? These are all, you know, we think, oh, well, no, I'm not, I don't have an eating disorder because I'm taking these protein shakes and that's a meal supplement. No, that's that you're not eating food. You're eating a supplement and calling it food. That's disordered eating. And sometimes we kind of convince, we try and talk ourselves into normalcy and it's just a form of disordered eating. Yeah. I know when I competed about 10 years ago, what I ate, you know, as getting closer to the competition, I would have egg whites in the morning. Like I still remember exact measurements because it was like every single day, but I would eat tilapia and asparagus four times a day. And it's, and that was for weeks. And, you know, looking back on it now, it's like, what in the world, you know, but, but you're right. Like, it's very easy to convince ourselves, especially like I'm doing it in the name of fitness, you know? And it's like, Really though, because 
I think I was almost like at my ultimate unhealthiest when I did step on stage, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, I don't know, it's that fine line or I guess the spectrum is, you know, yeah. like where, where yeah. are you? And, and saying that doing a bodybuilding competition or a bikini competition or a figure competition is bad isn't at all what we're saying. If that's something you want to do, if that's a goal, that, that's awesome. Like do it and understand that the way that you eat and the way that you train, it is for a short duration. It is for a time period and understand that when you're done with it, things are going to change and they're going to change rather quickly. Also understand that that is going to be a trigger for many people, either the diet itself, but more so the transition from competition life back to your normal life. That's where to be perfectly honest, having some kind of a psychological support team would be very helpful, even for people who don't think they have a problem. I think that should almost be built into people who want to do these figure bodybuilding competitions. Like, hey, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with you, but maybe you should probably get a therapist, someone to talk about because your body is going to go through some serious changes and it can play games with your mind. I know. I mean, I've trained a lot of people for bodybuilding shows and figure shows. I, it's a science project is what it is. It really is. And, and I am, I love geeking out with science projects, but I'm very upfront with clients that come to me for that and say, listen, this is going to mess with your head. It's going to mess with your head. And you, you need to have a good support system for this during and after. I think that's a good way to, because people are going to come to you if you're still training and and ask you to train them for these competitions. First, why? Why do they want to do it? Because a lot of people on the spectrum are using that to lose weight, to change their body, not because they want to get on the stage. Mm -hmm. And then help them do it safely and really help them transition out of that lifestyle. Yeah. And for women out there too, like the same with bodybuilding, I think of, you know, I've had two kids. When you talk about your body being a science experiment and having support, I mean, there's a lot of people that are going to listen to this that, you know, are moms that have gone through, I mean, it's really fascinating what your body can do and survive. Um, but with that said, it's, you know, that's, that's one thing, but what's the, you know, what's the why coming back to the whole idea of, let's be honest. No one, I don't know what normal is. I, I think normal is just throw it out the window. We all are trying to do the best we can to stay as healthy and feel good. And as a fitness professional, we're not here to tell you what to eat. We're not here to tell you, you know, how you look in those pants. And at the end of the day, we're here to support you so that you feel good so that you can go out and feel empowered, so that you can feel confident, so that you can be happy. We are like, you know, people that just happen to know exercise science, but we're like fitness psychologists over here. We're just trying to help your body feel good and be strong so that you don't fall when you're older, so that you can live independently for as long as possible. That if you do wanna compete, we're gonna help you compete, or if you're an athlete, help you perform better. But what we're not here to do is talk about your weight and talk about what you look like and what's appropriate. But what we need to do, which we haven't talked about today, is that if you do think that you're working with someone or it's a friend that is you know, suffering or you notice that they constantly say, you know, I need to lose 20 pounds or I hate the way I look or I just, you know, why do we feel so uncomfortable having a conversation of, you know, you don't have to say, oh, I think you've been eating disorder. You should go see someone. No, it's, you know, and, and Carly said this before, and I've said this to people, hey, you know what? It's really, it makes me so sad. Why, why would you say that about yourself? You know, you're, you're an amazing person. You know, wh what is it that makes you feel you have to lose 20 pounds? And a lot of people who say it don't need to lose the weight. I mean, clearly they may be underweight um, to begin with, but what is it? And why can't we just say something so that at least 
they know that I hear you, I see you, and listen, if you ever want to talk to me, I'm here. Let it go. That's it right there. You know, you never want to approach someone and say, I think you have an eating disorder or you have a problem or you need to gain, think, don't say you need to gain weight or cheeseburger, eat just, the cheeseburger. Oh yeah. Just eat a yeah. cheeseburger. You'll be fine. I don't know how many people told me that, mm-hmm. but I, it's just a matter of going up to your client, friend, coworker, looking them square in the face, looking them in the eye and saying, you good. And it, when they're not, it's amazing how just that, just that the eyes are going to well up or the lip is going to go, or they're going to like, something's going to happen. And be like, if you don't want to talk right now, that's fine. Just know that I'm here. If you need something, no judgment, like, like, I just want to make sure you're good Mm -hmm. and leave it at that and check in repeatedly. Like, are you good? Like, you're all right. That's enough sometimes for people to be like, Oh, somebody notices. Mm Oh, okay. So in that situation, then if, you know, if someone does open up to you and they, you know, share an eating disorder or disordered eating, mm-hmm. you know, wherever they might fall on that spectrum, you would then like refer them out to mm-hmm. another professional. Yeah. Are you getting treatment? That would be your are you getting, yeah. Yeah. Are you getting treatment? Are you talking to someone? Are you seeing a medical doctor? Um, I think you should make an appointment with your physician here are some names of some psychologists, nutritionists, psychiatrists in our area that deal with this. I think every fitness professional should have a referral list, not just for eating disorders, but for all sorts of other things, depression, anxiety, gastrointestinal issues, right? All of these things, orthopedics, we need to be better at knowing what we don't know and yeah. understanding that not knowing any, not knowing everything doesn't make us a bad trainer. Yeah. Understanding that there's no way we could know all of these things is going to make us a better trainer. So start to put together a referral list, start to call professionals in your area and say, Hey, I'm putting together a list. If you have a patient, a client who's looking for exercise, can you refer them to me? And I will refer them to you if they're looking for orthotics, you know, and just build that relationship. A, it's going to help you build your business. Yeah. And B, it's going to make you a resource for your clients and someone that people are going to respect and refer people to forever. Because you can only be asked someone for so long before it comes out, right? Yeah. So know what you don't know and own it. Like, you know what? I don't know, but I know someone who does. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you both so, so much for this today. I feel like I could probably talk to you for like another hour and longer about all sorts of different subsets of things that came out of this conversation, but in, in the sake of your time and everyone watching as well, um, I think we'll kind of wrap up here, but before we go, I'd love for you guys to share where people can find your course and also connect with both of you. So, so where are you in the world? <laughs> so if you would like, if you're interested in taking the course, you can go to medfit, M-E-D-F-I-T classroom.org. And all of the, you know, all, there's a lot of courses on there, but we are the only eating disorders for fitness professionals. And you know, I'd just like to say, if you're not a fitness professional, this course is still for you. You're a parent, you're a friend, you're a coworker. It really is for everyone and anyone, because most likely there is someone suffering that you don't know. So medfitclassroom.org is where you can find that course. And then I am, you could find me or more information. You could reach out to me. My website is just christineconti.com super easy. All my email contact information is there. And of course, you know, I love Instagram. So get underscore Conti fit. I'd love to see you. Awesome. Yeah. I'm a carly.taylor.com and on Instagram, I'm think fitness car with a K. Awesome. 
And we'll put links to all of this in the comments as well. So it'll be easy for everyone to find. So again, thank you both for being here. Thank you to everyone watching as well. And let's continue this conversation. Whatever you got out of this, drop it into the comments and, and let's keep talking because I think it's so much more powerful when we can all be open and honest and, and bring this topic to light a little bit more. So have a wonderful day. Thanks everybody. Thank you.